Welcome to Topic 2, Energy and States of Matter. I'm Mr. Rast, and we're going to start our first lesson on energy and states of matter right now. So we're going to start this off with the simple question, what is matter? We're talking about matter here, so what is it? Matter is something which occupies space and mass. Everything is matter, except for space, outer space. But even the air in the room that we're in right now has matter in it. If you move your hand quickly around the room, you can feel that matter moving across your hand. Gas is matter. An atom is the smallest unit of matter. So this is how we're starting to branch into chemistry right now. We're going to talk about matter and energy and atoms, and we're going to get into the chemistry of this stuff pretty soon. An element is a substance that is made entirely of one type of atom. So atoms are the smallest unit. If you have a whole bunch of the same types of atoms, you have an element. These are all a bunch of a group of atoms that are the same. That's elements. They're, they have the same structure, um, amount of protons in particular. A molecule is a substance made of two or more elements that are joined together chemically, which this is matter. So the basic unit is, is atoms. If you have a whole bunch of the same atoms, they're elements. When you put different atoms connected together, those are molecules. And finally, another example of matter that will come up in our, the lab we'll be doing pretty soon here is mixtures. And mixtures are substances made up of different elements or molecules. So if you have different elements mixed together and or molecules mixed together, that's a mixture. So the air that you feel moving around when you move your hand back and forth, that is a mixture. It's not an element. It's, it's mostly elemental nitrogen, but it's not. There's, there's oxygen in there too, but roughly 80% of that air that's, that's when a windy day or you stick your head out the car or something <laughs> out of the window of a car, um, that's primarily nitrogen. So what are elements? That brings us to the periodic table. The elements are right here. These are all the elements. If it's on this table, it's an element. If it's not on this table and you're familiar with it, it's probably a molecule. Like water is not an element. It's not on the periodic table. A lot of people think it is because they're watching all these wizard movies and stuff like that. And like, you know, like the element, you know, the, the powers of the elements. The elements are always like water, earth, and fire or something like that. That's, um, well, I guess it's a diff different definition, but these are the elements. Water is a mix is a, a molecule made up of two hydrogens and one oxygen. So you won't find water on the periodic table. Now on the periodic table, you're going to have all these elements here. You got all these elements here, but some of these elements, when you find them in elemental pure form, they will never be um, alone. They'll never be separated. They're always going to be paired. And these paired ones that they're, that they're always paired, we call the diatomic elements. Diatomic elements are molecules that are composed of only two atoms of an element. So they're always two atoms of the same element. Those are your diatomics. You need to know these guys. Whenever you are going to write the elemental structure, of these diatomics, you have to put a subscript 2 after it. So bromine is always diatomic when you find it elemental bromine. So it's always Br2. Iodine is diatomic, I2. Nitrogen is diatomic, N2. Chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These are all diatomic um, elements. These are the only diatomic elements. So there's one, two, three, four five, six, seven of them. There's only seven of them out of all these. All the rest of these guys are not diatomic. You have to know these seven elements. There's some tricks to it. So I'm going to share with you guys some tricks on how to remember your seven diatomic elements. One trick is a lot of people, a lot of, I, I hear this commonly referred to um, by, by chemists quite a bit. They say Brinkelhoff. Brinkelhoff is the diatomics. 
so maybe they're doing some calculation and, and they're like, oh yeah, I forgot that, that that was, there was supposed to be two of them. It's a Brinkelhoff element. I, I hear that commonly referred to. So Brinkelhoff, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Remember Brinkelhoff and you should be able to piece together which of your elements are diatomic. Another way to remember is have no fear of ice cold beer. This is really for my college students that are uh, 21 and older though, right? So this probably won't be too effective at uh, high school. So have no fear of ice cold beer. Hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine, oxygen, iodine. Now here's where it gets a little sketchy. Cold is not C, it's Cl, chlorine. If you just put C as diatomic, that's carbon and you'll be wrong. Or maybe you write cold and you go, oh, maybe it's CO. There is an element CO that's cobalt. That is not diatomic either. So you have to remember the cold would be CL. And then for beer, you would you can't just write B, that's uh, boron, that's not diatomic. And you can't write BE, that's beryllium, that's not diatomic. You have to remember that it's BR for bromine, that is diatomic. Another saying I've heard people use is, I bring cookies for our new home. Iodine, this one's a little bit better. Bromine is Br, but the cookies has no L in it. That's chlorine. You can remember C is just carbon and CO is cobalt. So iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. These are ways I've heard people study them and I'm sharing it with you guys so that might be helpful to you because a lot of people seem to find it helpful. I don't. I can't remember these things. It confuses me. I don't know why I'm remem remembering something like Brinkelhoff. I heard someone else call it like Hunkelbriff or, and then I, I just, I honestly personally get confused. I'll show you how I do it. The way I remember is because I, you know, you're allowed to use periodic tables. Periodic tables, just like calculators and chemistry, they're tools. You're allowed to use these things and you need to know how to use these things. So the only difficulty is remembering that hydrogen. Hydrogen is the only one that's a little bit difficult to remember, but it's really not that difficult. Hydrogen is diatomic. And then after that, um, how many did I say there were? There was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven diatomic elements. So let's go on the periodic table and go to element. I'm sorry, there were seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So let's go to the periodic table and go to element seven. That's right here. That's nitrogen. So nitrogen, we're going to start at, at element seven, nitrogen. And then I'm going to make a seven on the periodic table because it's seven. That's the magic number. One, or so I'm going to make the seven here, right here, all the way down. There, see the nice seven here? And these are my diatomics, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. It makes a nice seven on your periodic table. The only thing is you have to remember the hydrogen. So if you do this and you make the seven and you count it one, two, three, four, five, six, you might remember, oh, I forgot one. That's the hydrogen over here. Anyways, this is the way I do it. Uh, works good for me. And if you want to remember about drinking beer in your new home, uh, that works for you, go for it. Next class, I'm going to give an extra credit exam. Um, you have one class period to prepare for this. On the uh, extra credit exam, the elements on this slide here that are not grayed out, so these grayed ones are not going to count, the ones that are not grayed out are common elements that we'll be using in class a lot for practice problems or labs or whatnot. And I'd like you guys to start getting familiar with the names of these things and the symbols because I don't, I don't like people, um, chemistry is, is it's, it's like three classes in one. You only get credit for one chemistry, but obviously you're, you're gonna learn that it's like a math class. There's gonna be a lot of math in here and I'll be teaching you some math skills, reminding you about some math skills, but it's like a math class. It's a chemistry class, it's science. So we're gonna be dealing with all kinds of things, the periodic table and whatnot. But also on this part here, it's kind of like a foreign language. I don't want you saying, can you pass me that bottle of um, Fe? There's, there's a bottle with some Fe uh, powder in it because that's what it says on the bottle. You need to say that's iron. You need to be familiar with these elements and speak and, you know, like, I don't want you to say that, like, you know, there's a C that reacted with an O. You, you say carbon reacted with oxygen, okay? So uh, we need to be able to speak chemistry. So it is kind of like a foreign language too. Next class, if you can remember the spelling, 
and the symbol for all these guys, you have an opportunity to pick up some extra credit in here. But there's time. You can pick it up later. This um, is a video that I'm not going to show because I'm making a video, but this is a video made by someone else. It's uh, If you look on YouTube, The Fuse School. The Fuse School made this video, and it talks about the, the, the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. I really like the video because it's a visual of looking at the particles and how they move and interact. And um, I, I ask you to watch it. Um, I, wish I show it during class, but I watch, ask you guys to watch it. It's just a couple minutes long. It's not that long. And in the video, I like it because it shows that the particles are vibrating, and and that is a key point to what's going on in this topic. We're going to be talking about energy and matter, and that energy is why it's vibrating. So please take a look at that video. I'll link it. Um, I'll, I'll link it and, and put it on the website too, so you guys can take a look at that video. So the main gist after you watch the video is this. When we talk about properties, if we talk about a solid and we talk about a liquid and we talk about a gas and we talk about these properties like stiffness of the material or the shape of the material, the volume or the compressibility of it, let's go through and um, answer these questions. So of a, solids are very rigid. They, they, the molecules are not free to move around, whereas liquids and gases are not rigid. The shape of a solid is fixed. It's a fixed shape where a liquid sh shape, it's not fixed, but in particular, and I'd like you guys to make sure you note this in case there's a test or a quiz question about this, is the shape of a liquid conforms to the bottom of its container. It conforms to the bottom of the container. That's the shape or however much it, you know, it doesn't take the whole container. Where a gas is not fixed either, but its shape will conform to the entire container. So if you put a gas in a container, it will use up the whole thing. The gas will not sit at the bottom like a liquid will. And that's that's a key difference between shape between solids and or gases and liquids. And, and don't just simply say that the shape is not fixed for the two of them. The volume of a solid is fixed. And this one might trick you, but if you watch the video, it's not going to trick you. The volume of liquids are fixed also. It's fixed. You can't compress well, I guess that's the next one. <laughs> um, and But a gas, its volume is not fixed. If I take a container and I, I um, make it more room, but I don't add any more gas to it, the gas will fill to that container. And if I take a container and I crush it a little bit, if I, 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 I crush it down, the gas will take to that new shape too. So the gas can be changed, but not the liquid. And that brings me to over here. Um, solids are not compressible and neither are liquids. Liquids are not compressible either and that's the principle behind hydraulics. A hydraulic you'll push on one end you have a hose with a liquid in there and that will be able to push something else somewhere else. And hydraulic equipment is is based on the, the whole princ physical principle that liquids are not compressible. And gases like we were just saying over here we can take a container and crush down a little bit more so gases are compressible. So this is the main difference between our properties and you need to um, familiarize with yourself with those if you haven't already. Phase diagrams are very helpful when, um, when demonstrating how, what state of matter a substance will be in based on the current pressure and temperature it's in. Phase diagrams vary for every molecule, every element, they have their own unique phase diagrams. Phase diagrams describe the conditions and events in a closed system where no material can escape into the surroundings and no air is present. So in a closed system, what this means, a closed system means there is no exchange, such as a bottle with the cap on it. That would be a closed system. There is no exchange. So for phase diagram to work, basically all this is saying is that it's a closed system. There's no other forces that can act upon it. Uh, equilibrium is a state where the concentrations of all reactants and products remain constant with time. So we'll find points on a phase diagram, and I'll use the word at equilibrium, and that means it's a state where the concentrations of the reactants and products are remaining constant. That means you have, for instance, like ice water. You've got ice and you've got water at equilibrium, where the ice isn't melting and the water's not freezing. It's remaining constant. That's what that means. <laughs> This is a picture of a phase diagram. Um, 
in this here, we see on our x-axis, we have temperature. So as we move to the right, the temperature is increasing. And as we move up, the pressure is increasing. This is a generic phase diagram. A real phase diagram would have the name of the molecule or the element here. They would have a scale, actual values here on the temperature, and actual values for the pressure. This is just a generic one. We got to learn how to read a generic one. Um, the diagram is divided into three areas. All phase diagrams are divided into three areas, which represent solid, which is this area here, liquid, which is this area here, and gases, which is this area over here. Low temperatures and high pressures favor the formation of a solid. So let's look at that low temperature that's over this way and high low temperatures and high pressure. So when we move up here, that favors the formation of a solid. So if you're putting a lot of pressure on something and it's cold, the molecules can't move around very much and they'll get locked into that solid place. Okay, so low temperatures, high pressure, solids. Gases, on the other hand, are most likely to be found at high temperatures and low pressures. So low pressure means there's a lot of freedom and high temperature means there's a lot of kinetic energy. They're moving around real quick. And so we have our gases over here, more pressure, I'm sorry, more temperature over here and less pressure. So this area here is favored for the gases. Some key things, and this is really important vocabulary that's gonna come up big time um, in, in the next couple lessons that I'm gonna be giving you guys. And this is the name of the transition when you cross phases. So if you have a solid and it becomes a liquid, solids becoming a liquid, this is a state called fusion or um, a condition called fusion. So fusion is when solids become liquids. We often refer to this as melting. If something melts, it's becoming a, from a solid to a liquid. The reverse is when a liquid becomes a solid, that's solidification. And with ice, we call that freezing, but that's proper terms. We're gonna use solidification in my class. When a liquid transfers from a liquid to a gas, when it makes this phase change, that's called vaporization. And when a gas goes back to a liquid, when a gas over here becomes back to a liquid, that's called condensation. Sometimes things can go directly from a solid right to a gas and skip the liquid phase if the pressure is low enough. Carbon dioxide phase diagram would be like this at our atmospheric pressure, at, um, normal conditions. And dry ice is solid. And dry ice, when it when it um, heats up, it does not go into the liquid stage. It goes at our atmospheric pressure. It goes from a solid right to a liquid, and that's called sublimation. And if you go the other way, go from a gas right to a solid, that's called deposition. If you exist right on the line, if the pressure and the temperature line you right up on the line, then you have both at the same time. An example I gave before was like ice water. So if you line up here, you might, let's say our pressure is, is one atmosphere and at zero degrees Celsius, we have both ice and water at the same time. And that would be right in this, this um, equilibrium. This is an equal, these lines are points of equilibrium. And over here, if we were talking about water, this would be part liquid and part gas. This would be boiling water. If you've ever made pasta or rice or boiled some water for some vegetables or something like that, um, that would be 100 degrees Celsius. And you have both water or liquid and a gas at the same time. And that would be undergoing a vaporization stage. There are cool examples um, if you have the right pressure and the right temperature. So you can see like, you can have a lot of different opportunities to have boiling or freezing points here, um, but there's only one opportunity to have a triple point. You have to have the perfect pressure and temperature. And at a triple point, you would have all three states in equilibrium. So what it would look like, what it would look like would be a solid, a liquid and a gas all at the same time. It would look like ice water that's boiling. Um, I'm sure if you, take a look on YouTube for substances at the triple points. You can find some videos. It's probably easy to do. Um, probably people take um, water and put it in a vacuum and re drop the pressure enough to get to this point here and then adjust the temperature so it's at its triple point and you'll see water boiling with ice in it. Um, I'm sure you could find that. If you do, um, share the link with us. So 
your classwork for this one does not involve any math. It's just a review of what I just talked to you about. There's a kind of a lot of vocabulary. I'm setting the stage for what I'm about to do with you guys. So um, number one, it, you can pause this video right now and write these down and answer them. But let, let me just, I'll talk you through and maybe give you some hints and answers here. So number one, C6H12O6 is an example of what? Well, I talked about different types of matter. Is this an atom, an element, a molecule, or a mixture? And the hint is, I'll just tell you, it's a molecule um, because these are all connected together. Um, C6H12O6 has how many atoms in it? Atoms are all of the guys in here, so you'd add 6 plus 12 plus 6, whereas how many elements are in it, there's only three elements. There's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So you have to know the difference between that vocabulary. This is just examples of what I might ask you. Um, so go back in there, dive into these concepts, and make sure you know everything about these concepts. I'm just kind of cherry picking things, but I'll be looking at these notes when I ask you guys questions on the exam. Which of the following are diatomic elements? Make sure you know your diatomics. Is silicone, calcium, iodine, bromine, oxygen, fluorine, hydrogen, argon. I want you to tell me which of these guys are diatomic. Which states of matter um, is R compressible? So look at those different properties of the states of matter. Describe what a closed system is. You should also be able to describe what equilibrium is. What pressure and temperature conditions favor the solid state of matter? So look at those diagrams. Look, look, go back in the video if you need to. And what is the proper term used to describe the phase change from a solid to a liquid? Or for that matter, a solid to a gas? So make sure you understand all those um, and um, it should help you get ready for the next lesson we're going to be doing. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. That's what I'm here for. Thank you.